Joe Gladsome Light Podcast. This program contains preaching and teaching from an Orthodox Christian perspective to help you in your walk with Jesus Christ and to be victorious in Him. Well, welcome to the show. It's Old Gladsome Light here every Monday at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm your show host, uh, Al Manns, with a doctor degree in divinity, also known as Father Petros of the Orthodox Church of Upiris. I am broadcasting on W4CY radio, internet radio around the world 24 7. Also, I have a podcast on iHeartRadio called Old Glass and Light. Please visit my website, oglassomelight.org, like and subscribe. And I've got two YouTube channels, one named Al Mans and the other one called Arch Petros. In addition, I'm posting my Sunday sermons on Rumble under the name of Mans A, M A E Y E N S A. Now, the show is blessed by Metropolitan Mikizeldek of the Orthodox Church of Upiris. And our slogan is Preparing Souls for Heaven, Preparing Souls for Heaven. And broadcasting from St. Peter and Paul Orthodox Chapel in sunny West Palm Beach, Florida. Now, the last show was talking about the end times and the Antichrist. So before I get into part two, I want to do a little recap on part one. I do recommend you go and listen to part one because they are, are seamless. They work together because it may be three parts before I get this whole end time and the Antichrist show completed. But right now we're working on part two. So a recap. In these days, there's a lot of anxiety about the end of the world. It doesn't seem to matter whether you're a religious person or not. Many Christians, even outside the Orthodox Church, think about the end as a horrific time of the rapture, the tribulation, and the battle of Armageddon. In an oddly related way, secular and non-religious folks have their own brand of dreary end-time eschatology. Now there's that Greek word eschatology. In the Orthodox Church, eschatology is a study of the end times or the last days. It is a branch of theology that involves ideas about the end of the world the end of an individual's life, and the nature of the kingdom of God. The term comes from two Greek words, eschatos, meaning last, and loia, meaning the study. There is a significant increase now of cases of depression and acute anxiety, an increase that is due in large part to fear about the future and the end of the world and even our American way of life. Likewise, too many Christians, maybe even some Orthodox, are frightened of the future and have fallen into a soul-crushing dread of the last day, not to mention the terror of the afterlife retribution. But salvation, or rather theosis, should be drawn by love, not driven by terror, invited by the shepherd of our souls, Jesus Christ, and not bound by a taskmaster. Now, the rapture theory and you say, well, what is the rapture theory? Well, I'm going to really expound on that in a moment. Eastern Orthodox Christians, Roman Catholics, and some mainline Protestants view the rapture as a heretical teaching of the Christian faith. It was not preached or believed prior to 1830, when John Nelson Darby individually proclaimed that his teaching is what the Bible says Christ will do when he comes again. Jesus, Peter, Paul, John or any other writers of the Bible or the Christian Church Fathers did not preach about the rapture. We Orthodox should never worry about being left behind simply because there is no such thing as the rapture. And that word does not exist in Scripture. The word in, in Thessalonians says caught up. That is a correct word. And so the rapture, I could say, does not exist. You read that right. When Jesus returns at the second coming, that will be the last day, the great judgment and the general resurrection and the universal transfiguration of creation by the Holy Spirit all at once. Now remember, all of this teaching I'm giving you is coming from the church fathers and Holy Scripture. 
These events I just mentioned will not be separated into separate chronological events. This is what is meant by our affirmation of faith in the Nicene Creed, and his kingdom shall have no end. If a person is overcome by dread and becomes despairing of the end times, whether they are Christian or secular, then they are not thinking about the last days in an orthodox, healthy manner. The last days fills us with hope. If there's no hope, then we must have been tuning in to the wrong station. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, as St. John wrote in his first epistle, chapter 4, verse 18. Now, an Orthodox perspective from the Church Fathers, the Eastern Orthodox Church Fathers. We saw clearly that a man is coming in the future who will be the opposite of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be the instead of Christ, the Antichrist. And that word Antichrist means instead of. Anti Christ or Christos. Anti Christos is the instead of Christ, a mock. It's a total fraud. It should be known that the Antichrist will come, as Scripture tells us. But if the Antichrist will be a mockery and a parody of the true Christ, the devil will not incarnate as a human, only the Son of God became incarnate. Remember the virgin birth. He took on flesh from a virgin called Mary, the holy Theotokos, and dwelt among us for about 33 years. Once the Antichrist makes his public appearance, evil spirits will generate a global excitement over him. He will be hailed as the ultimate political savior. Most everyone will be placing all their hopes on him, looking to him to solve the world's political problems and financial turmoil. The true Christ will come from heaven, not on earth. The Lord Jesus Christ at the second coming will appear in the clouds of the sky and not on earth. But the false Christ, the Antichrist, will appear on the earth. So that's one of our signposts. So that's the recap of part one. Now I'm going to get right into part two. Now there are two witnesses talked about in the scriptures, and they are Enoch and Elijah. And they will oppose the Antichrist. Now, now a lot of people say, well, who are the, the two witnesses? Well, the Orthodox Church tells us it's Enoch and Elijah. And why is that? Because neither one of them tasted death. Enoch was translated, and Elijah left the earth in a fiery chariot. Both of them did not have an earthly death. Now, while the Antichrist, with the help of the demons, is stirring up global lust for him to be their savior and ruler, God in his mercy will send two mighty prophets, Enoch and Elijah, to warn everyone that this man is not the real Christ, but the Antichrist. And when that happens, boy, you want to talk about a battle. When you come against the Antichrist, man, all hell will be released against these two prophets of the Lord. Now, St. John Damascus states the literal opinion of the church fathers that St. Elijah will return to the earth with holy Enoch before the judgment day. This will fulfill the ancient prophecy of the prophet Malachi, chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, which states, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. The coming of Elijah and Enoch will also fulfill prophecy of St. John in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verses 3 through 12. What speaks of the two witnesses, also known as the two olive trees, and the two candlesticks, which is revealed in verse 4, who will tell the truth about the Antichrist and will warn the world about him, exposing his fake sanctity. This will continue for three and a half years while the Antichrist political machine is ramping up and gaining power, during which time the Antichrist is pretending to be a nice guy. Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. St. John of Damascus states that in fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy, Elijah the Tishbite shall be sent and shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, that is, a synagogue to our Lord Jesus Christ and the preaching of the apostles. 
Now St. John Damascus believes that some Jews will be saved from the following this Antichrist, and with the help of Elijah and Enoch, they shall repent and turn to Jesus, the true Christ, and become Christians. The Jews who repent are the fathers, the Old Testament synagogue, who turn their hearts to accept and to love their children, the New Testament church. The Antichrist will be annoyed with what these two great prophets are saying and doing, but at first will do nothing against them because he is trying to look like a really nice guy. But finally, in a rage, when he begins his egotistical tyranny as world king, the Antichrist will show his true inner evil self and will kill these two prophets and launch a fierce persecution against all who oppose him, particularly Christians. That's Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, and chapter 13, verse 7. I'll give you these scripture references to help you in your studies. You know that when these two prophets are killed, they will lay in Jerusalem for about three and a half days. And the whole world will see it because we have the internet. We have cameras everywhere. I mean, you can go look at a webcam anytime you want. Just go on the internet and call up a webcam and you'll be able to watch. So everybody will be able to see these two uh, prophets, Enoch and Elijah, laying dead in Jerusalem for three and a half days. And then they will hear a voice, come up here. And all of a sudden, they will go up. A miracle. Now, St. Cyril of Jerusalem on the Antichrist's quest to be the global king. Even though God will send Enoch and Elijah to warn humanity, which convinces some people and some devout Jews, most men and most Jews will be deceived by the false Christ, the Antichrist, and will run after him. The nations will desire that this wonderful man rule them all, and he will therefore easily grab the power of global rule. Now, St. Cyril of Jerusalem taught that the Antichrist is to come when the times of the Roman Empire shall have been fulfilled and the end of the world is drawing near. He shall seize for himself the power of the Roman Empire and he shall falsely style himself as Christ. The Roman Empire will have ended, shall, shall have been fulfilled, at that time when the end of the world is drawing near, the Antichrist shall grab and seize power for himself, the power of the old Roman Empire, which was a huge, powerful political machine that united nations under the one throne of one emperor called Caesar, whose worship as a god was a required part of the politics. And this was also the reason why so many Christians became martyrs they refuse to worship the emperor or his image. The Antichrist will have global power because authority was given him over every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. And that's in Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. Now, St. Cyril's catechetical lectures written in about the mid-300s A.D. state, And now in this same way, since the true Christ is to come a second time, the adversary, the devil, makes use of the expectations of the simple and especially of those of the circumcision, in other words, the Jews, and he brings in a certain man who is a magician and who is quite expert in sorceries and enchantments and beguiling craftiness. This one shall seize for himself the power of the Roman Empire, and he shall falsely style himself Christ. By this name Christ, he shall deceive the Jews who are expecting the anointed one, in other words, the Messiah, and he shall seduce the Gentiles by his magical illusions. If you know anything about the end times scriptures, we know that when Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, it was on the Mount of Olives. And the disciples who saw him ascend into heaven, angels were there. And it says, why are you gazing up into heaven? That Christ, you see him ascend, will descend in the same manner. So we know the location when, re when Christ returns to the earth, it will be at the Mount of Olives. This aforementioned Antichrist 
used to come when the times of the Roman Empire shall have been fulfilled and the end of the world is drawing near. There shall rise up together ten kings of the Romans reigning in different parts, perhaps, but all reigning at the same time. After these, there shall be an eleventh, the Antichrist, who by the evil craft of his magic shall seize power upon the Roman Empire. Of the kings who reign before him, three shall he humble, and the three remaining seven he shall have his subjects under him. At first he shall feign mildness, as if he were a learned and discreet person, and sobriety and loving kindness, having beguiled the Jews by lying, son, lying signs and wonders of his magical deceit, until they believe he is the expected Christ. He shall afterwards be characterized by all manner of wicked deeds of inhumanity and lawlessness as if to outdo all the unjust and impious men who have gone before him. Most people of the world will love this Antichrist and will want him to rule them. How insane is that? If you don't know the end time scriptures, and that's why I am doing this show on the end times and the Antichrist, through the eyes of the church fathers. From our own church hymn book, the Lenten Triodion, we hear in the Synaxarian reading for the Meat Fair Sunday that the Antichrist will be constrained by men and will be proclaimed king and the multitudes of the Jewish people will love him. He will restore Jerusalem and will erect the temple for them. There's a problem with that, isn't there? because there is a Muslim shrine on the mountains that has to be torn down. Can you imagine that? St. Ephraim, 373 AD in the sermon, on the coming of the Lord, the end of the world and the coming of the Antichrist, says the son of the Jews will accept the false Messiah, the Antichrist, and he will rebuild for them their temple in Jerusalem. And I believe things are already in preparation for that. Things are being put together for this uh, temple in Jerusalem. The Jews will rejoice and give honor to the reign of the Antichrist more than anyone else. And he, under pretense of preference and being industrious with them, will designate for them all a place in the temple. After the temple of Solomon is rebuilt in Jerusalem, the Antichrist will sit in the temple to be crowned king. St. Baesius the Athenite said that a sign that this prophecy is about to be fulfilled is when we see the mosque in Jerusalem being taken down in order to make way for the reconstruction of the Jewish temple of Solomon on the ancient Temple Mount site. This will be the time for the Christians to flee to the hills and the mountains that the Lord has spoke of in Matthew 24 verses 15 to 22, because terrible things will start to happen once the evil king is crowned in the city of Jerusalem. The final persecution of Christians will begin, for then shall be the great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor even shall be. And again, Matthew 24, verse 21. Now the dragon inside of the Antichrist reveals himself to this and desires to be worshipped. Having rebuilt the temple of the Jews in Jerusalem and having been crowned the king of the world, a great change in the countenance and actions of this global leader will be seen. The Antichrist will now openly display his real evil inner character which had been concealed and he will reveal his true desire. Like the pagan Roman emperors of old, the Antichrist and the devil living inside of him once worship, not merely political leadership, the famous kings in history who also sought worship from their subjects like Nero, Nebuchadnezzar, are just historical prototypes of the Antichrist. There will be a time when St. Paul's words will be fulfilled. The man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, 
so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. This will be the abomination of desolation in the temple of which the Lord prophesied in Matthew 24, verses 15 and 23. Saint Cyril of Jerusalem, 386 A.D., in his catechetical lectures, describes the Antichrist's sudden change of character once he has been enthroned as a global king, sitting and demanding worship. Having beguiled the Jews by lying signs and wonders of his magical deceit until they believe he is the expected Christ, he shall afterwards be characterized by all manner of wicked deeds, of inhumanity and lawlessness, as if to outdo all the unjust and impious men who have gone before him. He shall display against all men, and especially against us Christians, a spirit that is murderous and most cruel, merciless and wily. For three years and six months only shall he be the perpetrator of such things. And then he shall be destroyed by the second glorious coming of the from heaven of the only begotten Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the true Christ, who shall destroy him with the breath of his mouth and shall deliver him over to the fire of Gehenna. St. Ephraim of the 4th century writes of the Antichrist's desire to be worshipped. He will herald himself as the precursors heralded him. He will call himself the preacher and reestablisher of the true knowledge of God. Those not comprehending Christianity will see him in a representative and champion of the true religion and join in with him. He will herald himself, calling himself the promised Messiah, and the children of the worldly wisdom will hail his presentation. Because of his renowned might, being friendly and cheerful and capabilities, and his widest development of the elements of the world, they will proclaim him a god and will make themselves his accomplices. The Antichrist will want the whole world to worship him because the devil living inside him wants to worship that belongs only to God, the true God, the Holy Trinity. Like the ancient emperors Nero and Nebuchadnezzar, he will demand and force people to worship him. Now according to Revelation chapter 13, an assistant to the Antichrist known as the false prophet will set up a talking image in Greek called the icon of the Antichrist, which is the beast. Anyone who refuses to worship this image or icon will be killed. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. Saint Irenaeus saw Nebuchadnezzar as a prototype of the future Antichrist. Another church father. St. Irenaeus in the 2nd century perceived in the story of the ancient king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the book of Daniel, chapter 3, a prefigurement of the coming future of the ultimate wicked king, the Antichrist. King Nebuchadnezzar himself was a tyrant, ruling an empire. He sought all peoples, nations, and tongues to worship his golden image of himself that he had set up. Yet they refused to worship the image. They would die by being thrown into the fiery furnace. St. Irenaeus foresaw that similar the Antichrist beast in the book of Revelation, which also uses the threat of death to force the nations into worshiping his image. He wrote, And there is therefore in this beast, the Antichrist, when he comes a recapitulation made of all sorts of iniquity and every deceit. For that image which was set up by Nebuchadnezzar had indeed a height of 60 cubits with the breadth of 6 cubits on account of which Ananias, Azarias, and Mishael. Now you say, well, who are these people? Well, Ananias, Azarias, and Mishael, those are the Hebrew names. Their Babylonian names are Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They changed their names to be Babylonian, but they still retain their identity as Hebrews. Now when they did not worship it, 
They were cast into the fire, pointing out prophetically by what happened to them, the wrath against the righteous, which shall arise towards the time of the end. And they enter, a miracle happened when these three men were thrown into this fire, made very hot. It was so hot that when they threw them into the furnace, the soldiers that threw them in were burned. But they dropped into the fire, and King looked in there, and he saw four people walking around. And we believe it was a Jesus Christ came and delivered them, and they were brought out of the fire. No burning, not even a smell of soot. And that's where Nebuchadnezzar realized that the God that Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were worshiping was the true God. Now that image taken as a whole is a prefiguring of this man's coming, decreeing that he should undoubtedly himself alone be worshipped by all men. Now no pre-tribulation rapture into heaven for the end time Christians. These three holy youths I just described are seen by St. Irenaeus as a prefigurement of the church in the end times, that they shall be persecuted severely by the Antichrist for their refusal to worship him or the image. Believers must remain strong at that time. Endurance is needed. Patience is needed. Just read that in Revelation chapter 13, verse 10. There will be no pre-tribulation rapture. Not in Scripture. The word caught up is in Scripture as a miraculous escape route into heaven to avoid end time persecution. The concept of this, of escaping the Antichrist's final persecution by a divine rapture up to heaven is a modern day false teaching that only a certain percentage of the Protestants even believe. History on this now? It was invented in Scotland in 1830 by Margaret MacDonald and promoted widely by the Englishman John Nelson Darby, who people credit as the originator. Before these two people lived, no Protestant, Roman Catholic, or Orthodox Christian ever heard or believed such an idea. Rather, the historic Christian view has always been to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, the exhortation of believers to, en to endure and saying, He who endures to the end shall be saved. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Orthodoxy rejects and has never taught this innovation and recently developed modern-day theory of the escape rapture that will gather Christians into heaven ahead of time so that they will not have to see the Antichrist nor be persecuted by him nor undergo a period of persecution, trial, or tribulation. If there was such a rapture into heaven of the Antichrist persecution, then all of Jesus' warnings to the believers to watch out and not to be deceived by the false Christ would be useless warnings. And that's also in Matthew 24, verses 23 through 27. Rather, Scripture teaches that it was given unto him, the Antichrist and the beast, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. Obviously, the Christians will be still on the planet if the Antichrist is going to be fighting and persecuting them. If the saints the believers had been previously raptured, caught up into heaven prior to the Antichrist persecution of them, then the scripture, Revelation 13, 7, would mean nothing. Rather, St. Paul explains that the real rapture, or being caught up, of believers being caught up into the sky is simply the gathering of the believers who are still alive on the earth and enduring to the end to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air when he finally returns on the clouds of glory at his second coming, which takes place after the Antichrist persecution. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. This gathering of the remaining faithful Christians, the elect, to Christ at his second coming will follow the period of the great end-time tribulation 
that Jesus himself described. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. And this can be read in Matthew chapter 24, verses 29, 30, and 31. Now the Antichrist short three and a half year violent reign. Immediately after the tribulation of, of those days, the Holy Scripture is very clear that before Christ's glorious return in the sky, there will be a terrible time of persecution for believers with no pre-tribulation escape rapture. True believers must be strong, patient, and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 13, verse 10. Many will be witnesses for the true Christ and will be beheaded become, becoming martyrs. Revelation 20, verse 4. Now it's interesting that I use the word beheaded. And every time you see an execution by Muslims, they usually cut their head off. And they interviewed a Muslim. Why do they do that? And he said, the head is easily detached from the body at the neck. It is the smallest diameter. It's easy to detach the head from the body with a sword and behead a person. And if you just look through history, you'll see that that's the preferred method of execution for the Muslims is to chop your head off. Even France used it during the French Revolution. They call it the guillotine. The same idea. Now for a short period of, of three and a half years, the Antichrist will have been deceived the whole world pretending to be nice so that he could take over the political control. But then after becoming the global monarch for a short period of about three and a half years, he will try to force humanity to worship him. Like I told the story of King Nebuchadnezzar, the Antichrist will use his devious and evil means to do so. He will use coercion to force all people into his spiritual and political camp by controlling the buying and the selling of all goods and services you know about the mark of the beast, either the forehead or the hand. Thus, after a pre-reign period of the first three and a half years of campaigning, during which time he fakes kindness in order to gather global political support, then following his coronation as global king in Jerusalem, the Antichrist will have a short yet violent reign of about three and a half years. St. Paisios of Mount Athos took this time frame to be literal. Thus, the total is seven years allotted to the Antichrist from his first appearance on the world scene until his overthrow at Christ's second coming, as described in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Now, the false prophet and the mark of the beast, and we all know that to be the number 666. In seeking all of humanity to worship him, the Antichrist will have the aid of an assistant, the false prophet, a second beast, a sort of global religious leader. And if you want to look at those references, Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18, and Revelation 19, verses 19 through 20. Just as a forerunner, St. John the Baptist gathered followers for the true Christ, the false prophet, in the time of the apocalypse, will gather followers for the Antichrist. And just as the apostles sealed the new Christians with the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit, which we call chrismation in the Orthodox Church, that can be seen in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. This chrismation marks them for God, so too the false prophet will seek to formally mark all of humanity with the Antichrist name or number, the mysterious 666, either on the hand or on the forehead. Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 through 18. This mark, whatever it proves to be, we Orthodox Christians view as a serious 
denial of Christ. We must not accept it. Accepting it, it will be a re rejection of one's holy chrismation and a rejection of God. Modern day saint and wonder worker, Saint Paisios of Mount Athos, in speaking of the coming 666 mark, said that if a Christian accepts the mark of the beast, he or she will have denied Christ. Pretty serious. He believed it to be some form of a computerized personal ID number. It's similar to the social security number. I mean, if you have children, to claim those children on your tax form, you have to create a social security number for them or you can't claim them. Interesting, isn't it? He noted that in the Old Testament, the Jews required a yearly tax of 666 gold talents from conquered nations. Thus, St. Paisio said that today, in order to subjugate the whole world, they'll once again introduce the old tax number linked to their glorious past. That is, the 666 is the number of mammon. Everything is going as planned. They put the number a long time ago on credit cards. As a result, he who is not marked with the number 666 will be unable to buy, sell, get a loan, or even find work. You know this happened in Nazi Germany. When Hitler came to power, the Nazi party was the party supreme. And you had to be a member of the party or you couldn't buy, sell, get a loan, or find work. You have to be in the party. Interesting how these historical events parallel into what I'm talking about today. Now, accepting the devil's ID mark on the hand or the forehead will be a rejection of the gift of the Holy Spirit, which we received at Holy Baptism in the anointing of Holy Chrism, the sealing of one hand, hands and forehead by the priest, the true mark of the true Christ, the true Christ, okay? St. Paul wrote, when you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. This holy seal of God is mentioned again in Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, as a seal on the foreheads of the servants of God. It is literally placed on the hands and forehead of each newly baptized Orthodox Christians to give to them the Holy Spirit through the Holy Chrism, the sacred anointing oil, the Holy Miron, following their baptism. With that, the Holy Baptismal Seal, we denied the devil and sided with Christ, as St. Paisio stated. Now in the Orthodox Church, before the candidate would even come up for baptism, at the back of the church, uh, the priest will lead him in three exorcisms and then he would have to open the door and spit on the devil, actually spit on the devil. And, uh, and people driving by in the car say, what is going on over there? But the, this is part of the bringing that candidate into the church, Holy Orthodox Church. And then he has to make a proclamation the priest asked him, have you united yourself to Christ? And that candidate says, I have. He asked him that, him or her that question again. And the answer is, I have. And a third time, have you united yourself to Christ? I have. And then the person would have to recite the Nicene Creed of what we believe. In the Greek, they call it the stable. And uh, that is a root word, faith. The statement of our faith we believe and so read the nicene creed uh, which is established in 325 a.d in the first council and finished in the second council they wrote it all down all the bishops wrote it down what we believe per instructions of of the emperor at that time saint constantine now the baptismal seal of the holy spirit is the opposite of the devil's seal which also will be marked on the right hands and the foreheads Revelation 13, 16. This fake chrismation of the devil removes the Holy Spirit and brings a person into the devil's kingdom of darkness. It will be used to control them through fear because without it they cannot buy any food. And he, the false prophet, causes all 
both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name, and that is 666, Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18. A warning from Holy Scripture, do not take the 666 mark, the devil's chrismation. Receiving this mark of the Antichrist will send a person to eternal hellfire. For any Christian who accepts it, it is a denial of Christ, a betrayal, which cancels out their previous holy chrismation seal, mark of the Holy Spirit, and sends them to hellfire since they put their trust in the Antichrist and his system instead of keeping their trust in the true Christ Jesus. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, who receives the mark of his name. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. The false prophet will try to coerce all humanity to accept the Antichrist chrismation, the mark of the beast, by arranging life so that the new global government's one world economy, no one will be able to buy or sell without that mark. Those who do not take the mark face economic disaster, famine, and starvation. Quickest way to get to a person's attention is for them to get hungry, and their stomach hurts, and they want to eat. And boy, uh, it would be easy to fall into that trap. But uh, you don't want to do that, as I've been reading here. Going on with St. Andrew of Caesarea, he talks about the mark of the beast. Now, uh, St. Andrew of Caesarea, around 637 A.D., who for a century has been an Orthodox authority on the interpretation of the book of Revelation, spoke of this in his famous commentary on the Apocalypse. He wrote on this mark of the beast or the Antichrist. He will strive to place upon all the outline of the ruinous name of the apostate and deceiver in their right hands in order to cut off the doing of right and good deeds and likewise in their foreheads in order to instruct the deceived to be bold in deception and darkness but it will not be received by those sealed in their faces with the divine light revelation chapter 7 verses 3 and 4 and the seal of the beast will be spread everywhere in buying and selling so that those who do not receive it will suffer a violent death from the want of necessities. Now St. Ephraim the Syrian on the mark of the beast. St. Ephraim the Syrian in the fourth century in the sermon on the coming of the Lord and the end of the world and the coming of the Antichrist wrote this about the mark of the beast. Beloved, we need a lot of prayer and tears in order that some of us prove strong through the trials because the beast will work with many illusions. He himself is an enemy of God and wants to destroy everyone. The torturer will use such means so that all who will have the mark of the beast on themselves in due time, that is, at the fulfillment of time, when the Antichrist comes and deceives all with these signs. And only in the case that they have the mark will they be able to purchase food and other necessities, and he will set up supervisors to enforce his orders. My brethren, notice that the willingness of the beast, which is above all measure, and the contriving of his wickedness, he will now start with the stomach, so that man, when brought to an extreme of food deprivation, will be compelled to accept the mark, or rather the wicked profane symbol, not just on any part of the body, but on the right hand, and also on the forehead, so that he will be unable afterwards to make the sign of the cross with the right hand or to sign the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ or the glorious and honorable cross of Christ our Savior on the forehead. Therefore, my brethren, 
A terrible trial is ahead for all the Christ-loving people, that they fear not or fall into negligence until the hour of death, during the time when the serpent will be marking people with his sign instead of the sign of the cross of our Savior. And if someone will not be marked with the mark of the beast, that person will not be taken captive with his fantastic signs. And likewise, the Lord will not abandon such, but will enlighten them. Now, St. Paisius of Mount Athos warns Orthodox not to take this mark, 666. Christians who reject this mark and refuse to worship the image of the Antichrist will be seen as religious rebels and extremists, unfortunately, and will be persecuted by the authorities becoming martyrs for Christ, as in the days of the Roman Empire. However, St. Paisios the Athenite warned that not all Christians will see any danger in taking the devil's mark. He believed that even some Orthodox Christian priests will be fooled and will not warn their flocks. Instead, they will diaper their spiritual children with comforting lies and then tell them to take the mark, and not to worry, saying, it doesn't matter, it's nothing. How sad is that? These clergy will not be able to discern the sign of the times and will earn for themselves the same rebuke that the Lord gave the, to the Pharisees in his day. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times, Matthew 16, verse 3. Yet those Christians, nonconformists, who actually refuse the 666 mark will be hated by all nations for Christ's sake, as the Lord prophesied in Matthew 24, verse 9. Because of the Christian rebellion against the Antichrist claims, the Antichrist will launch the fiercest persecution of Christians ever seen in history, as the Lord predicted in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. Then shall be the great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. But out of his mercy, for the sake of those faithful followers who are going to be saved, the Lord Jesus Christ promised that those days will be shortened. Matthew 24, verse 22. And I'm going to have to stop here. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to stop the show. Uh, I'm going to have to come back and talk uh, about the Great Tribulation from uh, the eyes of St. Ephraim the Syrian. We, we got to wait till, till part three. And uh, the end of part three is going to be quite amazing. So I can hardly wait to get to the part three and, and teach that part of, of this uh, end times and the Antichrist. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, glory be to Jesus Christ. for listening to the Oglad Some Light podcast. We hope this program has encouraged you to fight the good fight of faith and walk in the accordance with the commandments of our Lord. May God bless you on your journey to salvation. Jesus Christ,